gesprochen. Greetings and welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join the conversation. Please call in with your questions or comments to area code 415 871 2474 or tweet us at thinktechhi. Today we're gonna to do something a little bit different. Uh, we've been doing these shows for six months now, and in that time, I've been collecting questions sent to me by viewers and fellow HR professionals. Today we're gonna to take a chance at looking at some of the more interesting questions to see how you might choose to react to some of them. Now these are fairly common. Uh, I went through the list and kind of screened them and looked for the ones that um, uh, appeared the most, and some of them are uh, only came up once, but they're so interesting that they're worth uh, discussing. So I have the list, and we're gonna go over those right now. Uh, myself and my invisible evil twin here will be um, commenting on, on how I would respond as an HR professional to some of uh, these issues, okay? So here's the first question. My uncle, is newly arrived from the Philippines. He does not speak nor read English very well. He wanted me to call the HR department and find out some information about his medical coverage. The HR person I talked to said he can't give out information to anyone but the employee. Is this true? How can I help my uncle? Um, actually, it is true. Uh, the HR department, uh, by law, is obligated to keep all of the uh, detailed information about conditions of employment, pay, benefits, and other um, issues confidential. And so they're not supposed to discuss those things with anyone but the employee. If your uncle uh, really does have an issue where it's difficult for him to understand, then what I would have you do is write a letter to the HR department uh, that says that you are your uncle's agent and translator and that um, your uncle gives permission for the HR department to discuss issues of pay, benefits, and working conditions with you. Um, and then have your uncle sign it, have him take it to the HR department, and that way, when um, he has questions, uh, he can get an answer and you will be able to uh, interpret for him either via phone or um, in person if you go to visit uh, your uncle's working place. So um, this was not, I don't think, the HR person trying to be difficult, but it really is a matter of respecting the employee's right to privacy and the need to maintain confidential information and keep it confidential. So thanks for that question. Um, let's move on. Ooh, this, here's an interesting one. This one is about overtime. I work for an office cleaning company. Sometimes I have to work on Saturday, but when I do, I don't get overtime. My cousin, who does the same job for a union company, gets overtime for Saturday work. Is my company ripping me off? And the answer, I would say, is probably not. Uh, this is a misconception that many people have about overtime. But the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act uh, says that you get overtime pay at one and one half times your hourly salary or, or uh, hourly pay rate for hours worked over 40 in a week. And it doesn't specify uh, days, times, specific shifts. Now, you mentioned, caller, that your cousin uh, does get uh, overtime pay for Saturday, but that your cousin is a union member. And that is probably something that was negotiated by 
the union with the employer so that uh, union members would receive overtime pay for Saturday. So take a look at your pay stub, and if your pay stub says that you've worked 40 hours or less uh, per work week, even if you did work on weekends or night shift or something like that, then you would not be eligible for overtime pay. Uh, and if this is something that you feel that you really do deserve, what you may want to do is ask your cousin to let you know the next time a position opens up at his or her uh, working place, and then apply for a position where uh, union members do receive this kind of overtime pay for working on Saturdays, okay? And, and thanks for writing in. This is another misconception that people often have about, um, uh, about working uh, on weekends, night shifts, um, and this kind of, of situation. No one likes doing it, but unfortunately, the law does not require uh, employers to compensate workers who do work those kind of funky schedules uh, any extra for the work that they do, okay? Here's another one that's very common, uh, and this one has to do with drug testing. I am applying for a job with a company that has pre-hire drug testing. Can they really make me take the test? Yes, they can. Um, even though we're in an environment now where marijuana is becoming legal on a state-by-state -state basis, the federal um, law still says that, we, that marijuana is against the law, and so employers do have a right to test for marijuana as well as other illegal drugs, uh, either pre-hire or in a random type of situation. So yes, uh, the companies you're applying to do, uh, can make you uh, submit to a pre-employment drug test as a provision of getting the offer of employment. And you may want to, if you believe that this is an issue for you, that is to say that you may not pass the test, you may want to focus on employers that will not ask you uh, to take that uh, test, and then uh, avoid companies uh, that have that requirement. So good luck with that. Um, uh, if you are taking a medication that was prescribed by a doctor and that um, would come up as part of the items that are tested for on some kind of uh, pre-employment or random drug test, make sure that you take the bottles with you uh, to the test and you can show those to the folks that are administering the test and they will write that down along with the prescription number uh, so that you will not be penalized for having a, um, a narcotic in your system at the time of testing because you're, you're taking them for legal purposes, okay? So uh, good luck with your drug test um, and with your job search. Uh, and so um, just be careful with the drug test issue, yeah? Okay, how about, ooh, this one. This one came from an HR colleague, and um, they're thinking about some ongoing professional development. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking about going back to school for a master's in HR, or possibly getting my certification. Which would you recommend? Well, hmm. I have both, actually. I did go back to school uh, for a follow-on degree, um, and I, do, I am a certified HR professional. So I would say this, get both, uh, and here's why. The master's program, or following up education, gives you a good opportunity to bring your skills current 
to learn the up to the minute um, most common practices, not necessarily best practices, but most common practices in the profession and will give you an opportunity to meet and learn to work with um, people that will be competing with you for jobs. So you get a good chance to see how the market is going, uh, and that's a good thing. But certification shows the prospective employer that you are committed, first of all, to the HR profession. Secondly, that you're committed to ongoing professional development, because you do have to recertify periodically. And it also shows that professionals recognize your skills, knowledge, and ability as um, current and relevant to the profession. And that, that's the difference between a degree and certification. Degrees show that from a university perspective that the faculty of a particular university recognize your skills as um, uh, deeper and more detailed maybe than, than others who don't have uh, a degree. But certification is granted by the professional organization, and so it's other HR professionals saying, yes, Cheryl is, uh, she knows what she says she knows, and we as fellow professionals um, support uh, her assertion that she is uh, a well-qualified professional in the field. So it's very import important to uh, pursue appropriate certification, as well as to update your certification when, um, when you've moved up and gotten more experience. One of the issues that I find uh, very troubling is the issue of people that are under-certified for the uh, position that they currently hold. So say, for example, you're a young HR professional, and the minute you're eligible, you sit uh, for the PHR exam, the Professional and Human Resources exam, and you pass. So then you're certified. And you continue to recertify as you climb the ladder within the HR profession. Now you are a chief human resources officer, vice president, or uh, director of HR in a uh, particular company, and you are eligible for the senior delegate, um, designation, but you choose not to certify. You don't go back and take the senior exam. My recommendation to you at that point would be absolutely take the senior examination and become certified at the senior level because that then proves, again, not only that you are committed to your profession, you're committed to ongoing professional development, you are passionate about your profession, but it also shows that you are able um, and your colleagues in the profession are able to certify your strategic level of uh, HR knowledge, skill, and abilities. So do make sure uh, not only that you seek certification the moment that you are eligible, but that you also continue to uh, appropriately certify as you climb the corporate ladder. You want your certification to match the level of the organization that you are currently in, okay? And I am seeing a sign that we are headed to break, so please take a look at some of the awesome programming we have available on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we will be back for more working together in just a moment. Yeah, fan Thank you. Kindness, pass it on. A message from 
become the foundation for a better life. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia with more viewer questions. Do feel free if you'd like to call in and join the conversation. Area code 415-871-2474 or tweet us at thinktechhi. This question uh, came from another HR colleague uh, who is having some difficulty with turnover in her organization. And the email says, I work for a light industrial firm. Recently, we've been experiencing a great deal of turnover. One of our competitors raised their pay rate by 50, percent, uh, 50 cents excuse me, an hour. All of the employees who have left us now work for them. The president says we can't afford to raise wages. What can we do to reduce, reduce turnover? That's a hard one, particularly if your employees are at the level where an additional 50 cents an hour is represents a significant increase in uh, compensation. Uh, but there are some things you might try to do, even if the issue of uh, raising the hourly rate is, is uh, off limits and, and cannot be contemplated at this time. The first thing you might do is consider longevity bonuses. So say, for example, you hire a new employee, uh, the person lasts uh, six months on the job, and you would give them at that time some kind of bonus to reflect that they've been here for six months already. Uh, and then you could follow those along uh, at a year, two years, et cetera. If cash is not an, uh, part of the bonus that you could offer, how about offering paid time off as uh, one of the benefits? So say, for example, uh, you work for six months, you are then entitled to uh, an additional day off at the next three-day weekend. So we've got one coming up. Next week is Memorial Day. Monday is a three uh, is a day off for most of us. So you might tell employees, okay, if you've worked at least six months, you get the Tuesday after Memorial Day off with pay. Uh, and when you work a year, you might get whatever vacation you've earned plus an additional. Uh, number of days off. So there are ways to offer things that a competing employer is not offering that maybe don't cost as much as you thought uh, they might have. Uh, but this is, a, this is a real problem for employees, and I've certainly seen it in, in my career. And, you know, people, particularly HR professionals, will kind of look at that and say, why would they walk across the street for an additional 50 cents an hour when it's exactly the same job and the only difference is 50 cents an hour? Well, 50 cents an hour isn't just 50 cents an hour. It's $20 a week times 52 weeks. It's for people that are making close to the minimum wage or have large families, et cetera, this um, represents a significant increase to their take-home pay. And so people are going to do whatever they feel like they need to do in order to uh, continue to support their families and have a level of income that will uh, allow them to have a comfortable life. So uh, it really, for us as HR folks, it really isn't our, uh, Kuliana to sit and think about, gee, they're making a foolish uh, decision. That's not the issue. The issue is they're leaving and you don't want them to. So focus on that. What is it that has value to employees and can you offer it uh, in a way that continues to reward 
uh, longevity and stick to itiveness. The other thing you may want to consider that I have found um, often uh, is an incentive to stay is an employee referral program where current employees receive bonuses for uh, recommending folks that you then hire for other positions. Now, you might say that, ooh, but then we run into the issue of having entire families employed by the same company, doing the same type of job, and yes, but in the case of retention, that's a plus because people like working with their relatives, their friends, et cetera. And so you get the opportunity to continue to work with the people you love uh, in a way that makes sense for you. And, and so then you disincentivize walking across the street for a measly 50 cents an hour. So think about those kinds of things. It doesn't have to be cash. Uh, it can be other things that are meaningful to the employee, and that really is the issue. No reward is a reward unless the recipient believes it's a reward, okay? Um, okay, here's a hard one that I really kind of, uh, I, I've actually seen this happen, um, and it's a really sticky one. I supervise a number of professional staff. Okay. The, the person who wrote in doesn't say which company or uh, what kind of professionals, but professional staff. One of my supervisees has begun a romantic relationship with our vice president. They don't do much to keep their relationship quiet. Now, some department members are claiming that the vice president is showing, showing favoritism to her new romantic partner. What can I do? Some of our coworkers want to join forces and tell the VP's husband. The best advice I can give you about this uh, is stay out of it. First of all, to the degree that you can have a conversation with those employees that want to uh, let the VP's spouse know that this is a situation, if you can talk them out of it, do it. You, you really don't need that kind of headache um, in your day-to-day -day work life. Uh, if there is a situation that you are observing where favoritism does appear, uh, to be a factor, then you should speak with um, with the vice president. And if there's a perception that it is the employee that is the lower ranking person in the relationship who is using the knowledge of that relationship as a way to perhaps um, get over on uh, some of the more onerous tasks or uh, finagle their way into longer lunches, more days off, this kind of thing. If it's a performance issue, then you take it up with the employee just like you would any other performance issue without mentioning the relationship. If this continues, then you can take it up uh, as you go further up the chain of command with the vice president but as a performance issue, not as a relationship issue, uh, because unless you have an anti-nepotism policy or an anti-fraternization policy, it really isn't up to the company to make a decision about who people date, who they socialize with, who their friends are. So focus exclusively on the performance issues that are impacting uh, this specific employee's um, performance, as well as the performance of the rest of the group. And like I said, to the degree that you, you feel comfortable um, dissuading others from uh, squealing uh, to, the, to the vice president's uh, spouse, you should probably do that because nothing will be solved um, if they take this step. Uh, and it'll just make things a lot worse and a lot unhappier for those that remain. Okay. 
Um, let's see. Ooh, I like this one. This is a hard one, and so, um, and I've actually been here. I mean, I've seen this situation in action. Um, so the writer says, I am the newest executive level employee in a large service industry company. Again, they don't say which one. Um, all of my new colleagues have been in their positions for many years. The entire team has worked together for at least 20 years. I was hired to make some fairly significant changes uh, approved by the board of directors and the CEO, but when I try to get information about processes that would be affected by these changes, I get nothing but resentment and pushback. Below the executive level, I am very successful and I am building a good reputation. But the executives just don't seem to want to do what they've hired me to do. And they pay me a very good salary uh, to accomplish these things that just aren't happening. How can I get them on my side? You would have thought, wouldn't you, uh, writer, that because the board of directors and the CEO approved these changes and then hired you to make them happen, that they would naturally be supportive of uh, whatever initiatives you are putting forward to make these changes happen. But the sad truth is most people are change averse. So my recommendation to you, it's a terrible thing to say, and I know that you're, you're getting paid very well and good salaried jobs are hard to find. So here's the best advice I can give you. Number one, save your money. Number two, update your resume. And number three, start looking for another position that, um, in which you believe that you will not get this same level of rejection, pushback, and resentment. Uh, because toxic environments can have an impact not only on your work reputation, but on your personal health. And no job and no company is worth that kind of pain and heartache and um, unhappiness. So really, uh, you probably shouldn't stay in a relationship that you believe is damaging or abusive or toxic uh, to yourself, but you want to have an exit strategy that will put you in a good position to make your next career move. And I wish you the best, uh, because I've been there and I didn't like it much either. Gee, this half hour has really flown by, um, and we're down to our last minute. So what I'd like to say to you is, if you have other questions, please feel free to call in or tweet uh, at Think Tech Hawaii, or at Think Tech HI, I should say, or call in area code 415-871-2474, and we'll be collecting your questions, and then when we have enough of them, we'll be setting up another uh, Just You and Me conversation. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. Uh, thank you for joining us on Working Together at Think Tech Hawaii, and I will see you in two weeks. Bye. These are all the